Welcome, everybody. I have such a special guest, a heart friend. A uh, couple of years back, probably more so than that, my friend Linda Larson and I heard our names announced being inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. And it was such a dream come true for me and for Linda. And we got to share the moment of being in the same class. And I've also watched Linda do her magic on the main stage at National Speakers. This girl's funny, let me just tell you. We've had so much fun getting to know one another and truly is an honor to call Linda my friend. I want you to meet her. You're just gonna love her. So I'm gonna unmute and bring my precious friend in. Da -da -da. Yay, Yay, Linda, here we are finally, finally. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, I'm just tickled. You, I, you know what, I think back, Gosh, how many years ago was that? 2016. 16. Was it 16? Woo. I'm well, up at certain age where numbers come and go out of my head. <laughs> my <laughs> earthly go. <laughs> I think it was 2016, but it could have been 17, whatever. A good chunk of time that we have gotten to kind of bond and connect and see each other each year at the annual conferences. Yeah. And I just love what you do because you and I have a kindred spirit in the fact that we like to make people laugh. And I, I just I've seen you um, perform and it's incredible. So, Linda, kind of tell me about your journey to what you're doing now. I, I always like to let folks give a kind of a pattern or a path. I, you know, this I thank you for that question, because something just happened for me in my career that ties directly into what you're talking about in terms of humor. Um, I, like many people, have a story. You know, in my life, so many people do a history. Sometimes it's not always a beautiful story. But I had a mental health journey in my early years that was, at times, really traumatic. Um, and I got awesome help. And I really worked hard. And I learned how to manage all that. Um, and how what was important for me to stay in a place of mental well-being. And this was we're going back decades, but it when you have trauma in your life from a long time ago, that stuff hangs around for a long time. So with some really good professional help, I started unraveling all that and figuring it all out. So um, a little bit of my story shows up in my presentations. Uh, I was suffering from clinical depression, anxiety, and uh, the very morning I came the closest to taking my own life, I got kidnapped and held hostage by an escaped convict for six hours. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Um, so talk about you know, re making me rethink life and death. Well, you know, one minute I think I'm it's I'm out. I can't handle this anymore. And then the next minute I'm like, I think I changed my mind. <laughs> you know, when you have a 357 Magnum in your face, you kind of change your mind. Maybe how long? How long ago was that? Uh, in my twenties. In my twenties, uh, was married, divorced, had a two-year-old baby boy, and was making fifty-five dollars a week at a law office and suffering from clinical depression, anxiety, panic, just stuff. Goodness, wow! But see, here's the cool thing. So th that story shows up a little bit sometimes, just the part about about where I was in my life, and then the kidnapping and how that shifted everything for me, and how it set me on a path to really placing a high priority on my mental well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so I spoke somewhere years ago for a meeting planner who was now in Sarasota and headed up this big mental health summit. And she called me and said, I know you have a story. I don't think you tell the entirety of your story, but would you come and be our keynote presenter at this big summit and um, tell your whole story and what you do and did then to get to where you are today? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's the conversations about mental well-being, mental health that are so scary for so many people. And I and she said, would you it's called the name of the conference was Step Into the Light. She said, would you step into the light? And I said, sure. And so I wrote the story. And but I didn't want to just tell. The, OK, here was the story I wanted to go. And here's what I did then and what I continue to do to stay in this place of um, ah, just of joy and happiness and health. 
And then, you know what the number one thing was that came out as I was writing this? It was a 50 minute presentation. And number one, first thing that came out as I'm writing it was the power of humor. Mm. And I didn't even launch into my story. I first launched into some funny stuff that the audience was laughing. And, and for five minutes, I started, they're just laughing. And I said to them, I know you're probably thinking this was a bait and switch because it says in the program, I'm going to tell my story and I am, but I want to tell you more importantly, what are the tools that I used to help me get to where I am today? And I didn't want to just tell you, I wanted you to experience it. And it's the power of humor. So I just re I was reintroduced to that and reinforced that when afterwards it was hundreds of people in the audience. I can't tell you how many people came up and said, I forgot all about the power of humor. I think that's what's been missing. Things have been so stressful and I just, I just have been hanging on by a thread, but I forgot about that. So thank you for the reminder. And I think you sister, you're, you've been taking this message out into the world for the longest time. I had to, I just hadn't tied it back to, why it's so important you know it's fun it feels good it shifts your perspective and all that good stuff but man there's other powerful benefits so go humor <laughs> linda that is amazing i mean i my heart's just racing thinking about you being in that situation it, uh, you know it could be any any of us yeah. you know in, in that moment but the fact that you hit it head on and realize it was something and, and what, you know, I call that your ministry. I just do. I, I just think that you're helping other people go to that level where they too can get the right kind of skills. Girl, that's, that's, that's a story now. What a, <laughs> what, what a horrible blessing. <laughs> the, Dude, but that you, was perfect. A horrible it's, blessing. It's, yeah. It's, it's uh, what, what you can do with that. And listen, I mean, I, I understand exactly what you're saying because my, my best friend, she, she drank herself to death. She could not dig up the demons. She could not do it. And she would rather not live than to, than to dig up and deal. She just kept bearing it, bearing it. And that's what a lot of people do, but thank God you didn't. Cause you, it's no telling how many people that you have helped make that leap to say, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it. And that's really what our message is with a merry heart. You know, the, the Bible says, and I love this proverb, it says a merry heart do it good like a medicine, but a crushed spirit will dry your bones. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. Isn't that the truth? I love that. I just oh, do. Yeah. So like you have taken that message and flipped it into the joy uh, of, of knowing apparently how to tackle those feelings and the, and it, it's just like a creep thing that creeps in your head. And mm -hmm. it's a, I'm sure it's a battle. So what are some of the humor techniques that you have shared that can help other people move to the next level of some peace and joy in their lives? Well, first of all, I picked a partner in my life who has the same commitment to humor and laughter that I do. Um, I mean, that's important. Yeah. I was a former actress, a professional actor for many years. He was too. So we both come from this school of theater where it, where the more unabashed and uninhibited you are on stage in a comedy, the, the funnier it can be. So I picked a partner who had that same commitment to humor. And we have made a conscious choice to find the funny in situations. It may take us a moment or two sometimes, but sometimes we find it right away. Um, like for instance, when COVID hit, um, and we were both just like you know, deer in the headlight, kind of like, <laughs> what, what are you supposed to do now? Uh, spray my mail with bleach? I don't know. I, I know. know. <laughs> we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And we know, both of us, that when we get stressed, our tendency is to eat anything that isn't nailed down. That's <laughs> what we both do it. I've seen him sit and eat popcorn after popcorn, bowls after bowls. And I go, honey, you're stressed, right? And he goes, yeah, bring another bowl of popcorn. <laughs> um, so, we we did this thing where we said, oh, yeah, and you know, our thing is to just just eat so much junk food. And and then we looked at each other and said, oh, let's do it. Went to the store. I'm telling you, we swung through Kentucky Fried Chicken, picked up a box of chicken. We went to the grocery store. We got bowls, of, I mean, cartons of ice cream. We got uh, M&Ms. We got 
I just, and then he went, a tabloid, get a tabloid, <laughs> every junk food, crazy thing. And we brought it home and we put me in bed with all surrounded by all this junk food. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then I went, hold on, I got to put my hair in curlers and hold on. I got to put on a bathrobe. So there's this picture of me sitting in bed with curlers and holding a tabloid and eating ice cream right out of the container. And, and we're taking pictures and we're laughing and dog jumped up on the bed. And then we just lost it because the, the <laughs> best picture I've got in my whole world is of this me in bed with all the junk food with my dog at my side. And we look back at that. It was a strategy. It was yeah. a plan. Make something. We're going to do something funny with all this. And we look back at that occasionally. And, we, and again, I go, honey, honey, come look at this picture again. And we just laugh. So it's just that thing where you just consciously look for funny and make the choice to flip it and uh, exaggerate it. And have, and have fun with it. And it, I'll tell you, we've been married for 26 years now. And I will tell you, I think that's the number one uh, key to our success is being able to find the funny in situations where. Well, and, and you, as they say in Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail or whatever it's called, you chose wisely. Oh, I did, right? <laughs> you know, that's so funny because I had to marry a person that balanced that in my life. And he, you know, he just all of a sudden, will just take me to a different level and out of that mindset. But, you know, people struggle with so many things. And I mean, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but just last week we went on a wonderful trip. It was a European cruise, Ooh. the long boat, blah, blah, blah. It was fun. And I'm telling you, I got so ensconced in being pampered. And it's one of these trips that we had saved for and thought about and decided to do it with a bunch of friends of ours. But, and, and this is a very nothing at all to compare, but my mindset was so bad because we got canceled on our KLM flight. We were in Amsterdam and I had the little car and I thought I was going to be the savior of the world because we had friends with us. So I ended up trying to get us rebooked. I got us rebooked on the worst flight. We had really nice seats, not first class because we we are frugal people, but we got like comfort select or whatever economy, whatever nice er. and I'm in the back and it's like God just sent somebody to remind me of what's important. And so I was just, you should have heard me, Linda. It was pitiful. And I was like, I'm here. And I was in the back with all the crying babies, three rows from the back instead of six rows from the front, you know, and I was so pitiful, big cry baby. And this really cute young guy with these little sparkling eyes, like a disco ball, sat down by me. And I went, good. I was so mad at Thomas. I said, you sit over here. I'm not even sitting by you. And so totally out of perspective, right? So I go, let me just tell you what this terrible airline did to me. I have status and I have a card. And I'm, this is awful when I look back. And he just, he let me whine and go pitiful. And all of a sudden he said to me, well, how about that? And I knew. I said, oh boy. And I said, so what have you, you know, sheepish? I was fit myself going, yeah. I said, so what have you been doing? He said, I've been in Rwanda on a mission trip feeding starving African children. I just sat there and you know what I did? This is so sick. I laughed. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at me. I'm I'm such a diva. I'm so sorry. Yes, my husband, Thomas, come. Tell them about your mission trip. I mean, it was like verbal vomit. But all of that to say that my attitude <laughs> towards my circumstances were pathetic. I mean, and then it got worse. Believe me, we had another layer of this that even got worse. But even that little example of how you don't have, you got to get reminded of good skills, you know, find the funny as best you can with respect to the situation. And, and that is the magic pill to me is being able to have some levity and lighten up. And in your case, Linda, I'm just so thankful. Uh, you're a gift to so many that you have those skills that you can help other people with. And I, th I think the longer we live, the more we accumulate things we can give back to our audiences. And I'm telling you, that's when I feel like paying the meeting planner because I got to help somebody, you know, do you feel that way too? Oh yeah, absolutely. But look at you now. I mean, you're telling the story in a funny way. And I think that sometimes it won't happen right in the moment, in the moment. Oh, yeah. 
frustrated. But then as you look back at it and you see the folly of it, as you did when he says what he was doing, and here's what I'm doing. I'm, I didn't get my flight and I'm sad. And he's like, yeah, I'm helping starving children in Rwanda. That's like wah, contrast, the power of contrast. And it shifts everything. And look what you did. Now you're, now you're, you know, you shift. I love that. Yeah. I think that's well, let me tell you what I just did. I sent him an email. His name is Kent. He's precious. And I sent him a contribution. I was so, I felt oh. so crummy. I said, I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know, my whole perspective. And Thomas kept saying, you got to straighten up, you know. And he was right. I mean, I needed, what I'm saying is it's good to have a support person yeah. who can pull you back when they see that mm -hmm. you are not acting right or thinking right and have a perspective that's very unhealthy. And, you know, a lot of people don't know how to, I call it the hokey pokey. They don't know how to put their right foot in and shake it off and turn it around. Mm -hmm. And just when things just go wrong, even the littlest, like the little, little foxes spoil the vine. Those little things can gnaw away at us. And before we know it, we are about in the, in the pit. And it's so stupid because we can't, we can't see the brightness. We can't see the gratitude. We can't see the mm -hmm. blessing within these situations. But I think you have just so done that hokey pokey and been, <laughs> able, to, and been able to you choose well, live well, recognize when those things happen. And I can't even begin to understand how terrifying that would be. But I so respect the fact that you were able to use that to help other people. That's a wonderful thing. I'm telling you. Well, I think we, we, we use whatever we use, whatever we have. And, and every choice we just, are in the driver's seat in terms of how we want to view something, how we want to see it. Um, and there's the secret. There's a there's the gold right there. How do you want to view the situation? I'll give you an example. Um, so, so my husband wants to retire and he's got a date on his um, in, in like two and a half years or something like that. So he put a thing on his phone where he can press the app and it will show exactly how many years, months, weeks, days, hours and minutes it is until he retires. And so he's constantly going, oh, look, it's only this much more. Oh, and then we get to retire and then we get to have fun and then we get to have the thing. And I went, ah, stop. I said, okay. So I we did some math. I figured out how many days off he has between now and then. Days off, fun playoff. How many vacation days he has, play days. How many holidays he has off, how much. I figured it all out. And it was lots and lots and lots of days. And I went, are we going to miss all these days because we're looking for that date in the future? No, 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 no. At, he gets off one o'clock on Fridays and he doesn't go back until 4 a.m. on Monday. So I said, from one o'clock on Friday to four o'clock in the morning, you're on many retirement. You're in retirement just for that whole time. And on vacation, retirement, mini retirement, the whole time. It's joyous. It's celebrating. It's fun, fun, fun. So it's not this future date because I swear if I, I don't need to be negative, but I had this image of somebody going, I'm going to retire then, then it's going to work, then I'm going to be happy. And then the day after they retire, they get hit by a bus. I, I, you know. I think crazy things happen and I don't want that to happen to me. So I'm in mini retirement with him every single opportunity between now and then. So that's just, you know, how do you shift it? How do you look at what the situation is and go, but how could I make it fun? How could I make it funny? <laughs> yeah, I love I love that because the way you know, we're all on the stage of life right now where that is, we're looking around and seeing a lot of our friends <gasps> making that choice. And um, my big fear is that I just get stale and blah, and I don't want to do that. I want to keep, you know, I want to keep that vision ahead of me. I want to keep reaching out for something different and unique and still be able to serve people with, with humor, with stories and, as you do. But I want you to tell your, I know that's putting you on the spot, Whoop. your favorite story that if you had just one story to, to identify in terms of some humor, what would you, what would you say? <laughs> you probably got a bunch. Oh, I do. And I never have, t I really haven't told this story, but it's just something that happened to me that was so, that was, that was so out of the ordinary that I, I, to this day, when I think back on, I go, that didn't really happen, but it did happen. So I, 
I don't have it crafted in a story, but I will tell you what happened. I was, I was speaking in Mexico uh, for a group of, uh, I think, I, I think it was real, uh, real estate property managers. I think I'm not sure, but it was like 500 people, and they took everyone to Cancun for three days to to wow. have this conference. I was speaking at night on the closing night. And at night, I'm, I don't love nights. I don't love after dinner. I don't love when they've all had, you know, yeah. lots of drinks and things. That's not my favorite time. But I got to go to Cancun. They paid me well. I figured it would be fun. Well, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, everyone finished the last session at noon mm-hmm. on that Saturday. At noon, they were done. So what did they do? Uh. They went to the beach at this all-inclusive resort. Oh. where they spent the entire afternoon on the beach yeah. drinking and then they were told be back at for dinner at 6 30 dressed in your favorite movie costume movie <laughs> character costume movie character costume i had 450 drunk sunburned people dressed like harry potter and 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 <laughs> Indiana jones and marilyn monroe and all these people walked in and then but they had this whole dinner thing to do first. And so oh. they're drinking more. And <laughs> oh my gosh, that just hurts. <laughs> so at the whole time I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to go well. It's not going to, I got up on stage and everyone's talking. I mean, you know, and they're drunk and they're hanging, you know, like Harry Potter's hanging all over Marilyn Monroe, right in the front row and he's talking. And I'm like, oh no, there's one person in the room who's paying attention to me. He's in the front row. And that was the person who hired me. That was the president or CEO of the whole company, management company, right there in the front row, looking at me, giving me his full attention. The only one in the audience. And so I'm trying to talk just to him and put, you know, like put blinders on, don't see the rest of the people. And and I, I know you're thinking I'm making this up. I am not. I took that, it was supposed to be an hour speech. Can you even believe that? An hour speech after dinner? No, I think I went 20 minutes. I maybe went 20 minutes. I just smashed it all together. And then I left. I don't think they noticed I left, but I left. I walked off and everything hurt. My body hurt. My feet hurt. Everything hurt. And I just, I just went into the first door. It was a big ballroom and there was a door there. And I opened the door and went in. It was a closet. It was a storage closet. And I had just walked into a storage closet. So I couldn't come walking out. Because I figured everyone was watching me. So I just stayed in the storage closet for about 30 minutes until they picked up activity back there again. And then I just slipped out again. And I thought, no one would believe that story. (laughs) No one would believe that story. But now I look back at it. It's hysterically funny. Oh, it is. All these. Oh, my gosh. And then I thought, you know. Uh, sometimes you just show up and you do your thing and you take your check and you go home and you know right. there's only one person. And I think it was the one and only person in the audience who heard me. But um, but I think, you know, it will find things like this happening all the time. And it just makes it really interesting. Have oh, you ever had something like that where it was just oh, well, like you were swimming upstream the whole time? Oh, that, you know, I spoke last year and it was local. It was in Aiken, South Carolina. Wonderful group. Equine therapy, you know, uh, raising money for the horse community is a big horse community in Aiken. And so here I am going to the organizational meeting with my friend Margaret. She was going to play the piano because I told him I'd sing a little bit, blah, blah, blah. And so they said, we want to show you a video we'd like to show. Well, it was about Whistle the Pony. Well, Whistle the Pony had been attacked by a pit bull. And bless his heart, had had surgery, but you could still see where a poor little old whistle wasn't 100%. And then whistle was in a barn fire and whistle is burned. Well, I said, y'all, that is so <laughs> precious. But can you just not show that before I speak? I mean, that would be a problem. Sure. Do you think they listened to that one? No. Oh. Oh, it show, everybody is just, you know, all emotional. And I'm going to say oh, it yeah. ain't so. And then the meeting planner said, we got a surprise. And this little putting green is massive glass wall. Well, they jerked the curtain open and there's whistle. <gasps> looking at you like this. <clears throat> 
everybody, if it wasn't emotional before, it got ridiculously emotional. And the woman's going, blowing her nose. Oh, I know y'all are so touched, but sit down now. Drop me tears. We got a funny speaker. I went, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So Linda, I got up there and I said, I love ponies. Yeah, <laughs> I remember my pony, Peanut. I loved Peanut. The pony it was so precious to my heart. And gosh, thank you all for being. So I went, bleh, 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 you know, all this. And so after the program was over, my friend Margaret, the place piano, she said, I didn't know you had a pony. I said, I don't have a pony. But I got one real fast. The reason I thought about Peanut is because there was a picture on the back wall with a picture of a peanut named <laughs> Peanut. Isn't that horrible? I was such a liar. <laughs> you just kind of do what you have to do when you have to do it. See what I mean? <laughs> this is like, this is the, and because there would, I promise you, there would be people today who had this experience that you just had or I had. 20 yeah. years ago, who'd yeah. still be walking around going, can you believe they did that? I mean, that's just the most awful thing you can ever imagine. Yeah. I still, to this day, I think about how awful that was. Well, no, we can also think about how ludicrous it was and how funny it was and how we managed to make it through it. So good for us for that. Oh, listen, I told Jeannie this one and she thought it was hilarious because it happened in Graham, North Carolina at her old high school. And my, I was speaking to a bunch of farmers, you know, I love my little farmer community. And my, my one thing, the first thing that my heel got stuck in a hole and I couldn't move. It's like, I was going in circles. I could not get my high heel out of that hole. I was telling Jeannie, she said, Oh, I know that hole. I got stuck in that hole too. I said, that's a hole now. And so this old farmer guy walks up and me speaking, walking in circles and says, you sure stuck. I'm going, thank you. You know, so he got my shoe out, but that's not even the story. The guy that was in charge wanted a song for the retiring Miss Gladys. And she's just one of these sweet, precious women, you know, bake cookies all the time, sash shoes, house dress. I mean, everybody loved Miss Gladys, you know, that kind of thing. And so I remember they, he said, do you have a song? Because we're going to give her all these gifts. I said, oh, yes. Um, just say, Miss Gladys, you are the wind beneath my wings. He said, what? I've never heard that. And I said, oh, I know you have. And he said, I don't know, but I said, yeah, just say you are the wind. And I thought, this is this is going to be a bad deal right here. And so oh, he kept running up to me and saying, what was that name? What was that little line? I said, you are the wind beneath my wings. I said, this is going to be terrible. So sure enough, they get her up there. and She starts to cry. They gave her a trip to Branson, a quilt, new shoes, thank God. And I mean, just showered her. And that guy said, well, Miss Gladys, we just going to send you off with a special tribute. And we want you to know that you are the, uh, <laughs> here it comes, here it comes. Oh, no. said, you are the, uh, and he said, uh, oh, you are the wind inside of me. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm singing. It must have. Oh, I was crying and everybody said, did you know her? I said, oh, yes. I was laughing so hard I couldn't get through the song. Oh, my God. That is hysterical. But see, you sit there and go, this is a nightmare. And 10 minutes later, you go, this is a story. Oh, I can share this. Is. Oh, my God. Listen, have we all had the, the heel in the and the whole thing on a stage? Because I had a heel in the hole. Mine was, but it was a long time ago. It was a long, long time ago. And it was actually at graduation at graduate school. And you know how you walk across and you get your diploma thing. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it was a small conservatory at Florida state university. So there were only 13 of us. So, and everybody was there, the deans and all of those people. So it was like, Oh, this is so exciting. And I started walking across the stage to, you know, Linda Larson and I hear my name and I'm trying to look casual. I didn't walk across the stage in front of all these people. And my, heel went into a it was a crack between two pieces of riser I guess and it was just and I was tall skinny shoes that I could wear back in those days oh and yeah it no, in, but I was I was on a roll so I just kept walking and I stepped out of my shoe <laughs> so it stayed back and I'm just doing this little thing like where I'm walking like this as I go across the stage with one shoe on I was like 
maybe they won't notice that I, that I, and the person behind me got my shoe and bro, oh god we've all had a shoe <laughs> thing what's with that well i had to be interviewed for a beauty pageant for the beaufort water festival queen in a boat in a yacht and i had to walk down this long dock and oh. i got my heel stuck in a plank in between which was oh. so dumb and i am yelling Skip. i'm stuck and one of the judges had to come out and help me. <laughs> but I said, talk about an icebreaker. You know? <laughs> exactly. See, exactly. But those kinds of things are gold. If you can, Grady Jim Robinson, I don't know if, do you remember Grady Jim? He was in NSA, a storyteller. Oh my gosh. But he talked about speaking to the same kind of thing you did. A bunch of uh, good old boys that got a bonus check and party, party. And um, before he spoke, and, and his, his whole theme was the power of the story, which was a brilliant speech. And he said, right before he went on, the boss said, all right, I know y'all got your bonus checks. You've been celebrating, but we got a surprise. And all of a sudden, the doors popped open. And it was the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. <laughs> and they gyrated and did their thing. I have a friend that's one, and she's beautiful. And I mean, they did their dances and these guys unbuttoned their shirts and was going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, he said, when the last hip left the stage, the last, <laughs> the, last hip, the meeting player said, all right, you boys settle down. We got a speaker. <laughs> oh, what was a nightmare. But oh. you know, Grady Jim said, it's the power of the story that just pulls people in. And I tell you, storytelling combined with some takeaway. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to do. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm cheating my audience if I just say, here's another funny story. Here's another funny story. You know, um, yeah. the, some are just flat out funny because Lou Heckler has been such a help to me. He'll say, no, that's just funny. And he'll say, oh, that's funny with a point. That's funny yeah. with a point. And I like funny with a point. I just I do. do. Yeah. I think that sets us apart from what we would say, just a comedian. And, and so, it, I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of teased on what Jeannie would do. Yeah. She always got, I mean, talk about brilliance. She could spin yeah. a story like no other. She, you know, and I'm from the South. You're from the South. I'm from, I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama and um, well, mostly out in the country. But yeah, so I, I got the same roots there, girl. I think, and I'm not, I don't, I can't attest to the rest of the country and people from the Northwest or Northeast or whatever that is. Uh, but I think people in the South, I grew up on stories. My oh, grandmother, my grandmother used to sit and tell us stories when we were just little tiny kids and she'd tell us the old bar story. It was some big old bar he used to come around and he kept asking for his big toe. Where's my big toe? And all the little kids are sitting around and grandmother's telling this story about the bar looking for his big toe. And it was like, just love stories. So is it, is it just, I mean, did we all grow up on like Jeannie did? You did? I did? Yeah. Are we unique with that? <laughs> I, I, I was with a bunch of people from different parts of the world last week on that trip. And we'd sit there and I'd listen to them tell a story and I'd go, I will fall asleep. That's not even funny. And I wouldn't dare insult anybody. I met some wonderful people, beautiful people. But I'm thinking, ah, oh. and then I'm like you. People will say, Linda, tell the one about, you know, <laughs> tell the story about. And I get that all the time because people just love. And, and my little sweet tea book, one thing that I wrote in there is a story is how we speak in the South. It is just how we speak. We, 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 I mean, even when we correct our children, well, let me just tell you about blah, blah. You know? so <laughs> oh, I've true. heard that one. I've heard that one. But it's the way we connect dots to paint a picture. Mm -hmm. And it, it is really an art. And I, I didn't really realize it until I started hanging out with a bunch of humorists and watching how Jeannie could take a nothing story and create just beauty and stuff that people still laugh about. I mean, I was, I was talking to Debbie Childers. She's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. And Debbie said, Oh, did you hear the story about Jeannie's uncle that was buried three times? No. <laughs> did you hear about the woman in, in my church that we fried chicken for four times and she wouldn't die? Went, no. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, they just, it's like a tsunami. One story 
relates to another story. And, and like, and I tell this on Sunday afternoons, my grandmama would say, get in the car. We're going to see your cousin Wee Wee and your Aunt Fanny. I went, oh, who are these people? <laughs> oh, I remember that so well. <laughs> oh. You it's, couldn't get away from it, man. You got, you had to go sit there and listen. And, and at first it was like, oh, somebody deliver me. And, oh, and then you came, whoa, this is good. Oh, so nice to hear people who had that experience. I remember we had to go over to Uncle Ulysses and Aunt Flossie's house. <laughs> On the afternoon, Uncle Ulysses and Aunt Flossie. See, but the thing was, they had air conditioning, and back then, that was a big deal. So I didn't mind going over there so much. But I don't remember what I think I played jacks on their linoleum floor in the kitchen while they did whatever they did, or something. Oh like no, that. I, you know, I remember my mom and daddy. I mean, I, I know about the air conditioning thing because that was a real gift. We. We finally went over to see my aunt Annie. I called her Aunt Annie Ann. I added in another Aunt Annie, but um, she had color TV, and that was a big deal. And my daddy got so motivated when we got back. He didn't buy color TV. He got one of those sticky screens that you put over it, and people were green and purple. And you know, I don't know if you remember that. That's a poor man's color TV. But I did not know that. I knew nothing about that. Static. You have enlightened me. <laughs> oh Lord, that was hilarious. Just the way, just the little tiny thing that I remember. My granddaddy was a great storyteller and he used to, and he spoke Gullah and he would sit down with all of us and say, we're growing vegetables in the yard and I want to take some vegetables down just like that. I mean, it just, it was poetic and that's a dying language, which I love, but uh, did you, did you record it by any chance? Yeah, I did. Um, I've got the night before Christmas in uh, Gala. It been full dark to Christmas and all through the house. I ain't been a rabbit for stir. Neither been no mouse. Them stocking, they hung by the chimney. They had them sure and think the Sandy called to soon be there. They done gone very scraped. They been take about candy they had. <laughs> oh, I, but I learned that from my grandfather. He would tell us Bible stories too that, you know, they weren't, you know, we talk about Adam and Eve in the yard in the evening and then Nicodemus walked up and we're going, where's Nicodemus and Genesis? But, yeah. <laughs> but still, it's it's just the art of the way they process things. And it really, it truly is, is handed down. When 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 my cousins would sit there and say, y'all hear about Tara, Cud and Tara? And that was um, a funny, funny woman that lived on the island. And I tell this because it's about the way you handle things. And a teacher was so angry with her the last day of school She, when she retired and said, lady, I got a good mind to knock your teeth down your throat. And Contessa said, oh, I'll save you the trouble. She took out her dentures and handed it to the woman. Oh my God. But, <laughs> but they, everybody remembers Tedda because of her, the way she would flip things around and make it funny. And, and I, I'm like, somebody told me that when during the Great Depression, she went out to the chicken house to get uh, an egg and there was a snake and it had two big lumps in it. And she grabbed that snake and <gasps> held it up. And no kidding. She got those eggs out and threw that snake in and then took those eggs and fixed breakfast for her family. Have you ever? But she just could make stuff happen. That was wasn't going right, honey. She'd flip it around. <laughs> but how crazy is that? It's but, just, you know, just beautiful, beautiful stories of just its heart and soul and reality and authenticity and love. And my grandmother was blind by the age of, I don't know, in her 20s or 30s. I think she was pretty much. Oh, my. Yeah. But, oh, independent, wonderful. Um, she was like my savior. I loved my grandmama. Well, she would she was she lived in a trailer and my cousin and I were there visiting her. My cousin was the same age as me, uh, Selma. And grandmother, again, she's blind. All she needed to do was uh, she grew her own vegetables and she'd pick her own vegetables and she'd wash her own vegetables. But we just had to look and make sure all the bugs were off the vegetables. And then she yeah. would go ahead and cook the vegetables. Yeah. Well, um, we were out playing in the yard and Selma and I, and we saw a snake. And of course, we're like six years old or something. And we were running and grandmother, grandmother, we see a snake. She comes running out of that and it had steps down with a like a rope so she could hold on as she was walking down. She came out with the hoe and she's 
tromping down those steps and she goes point me in the right direction and she's chopping the ground like this and she and she's gonna point me in the right direction and she was gonna get that snake before they got her grandbabies oh isn't that beautiful precious. now is that all an um, alabama alabama is, is that, yeah that what part of Al what part of alabama linda well that was hope hall which is outside montgomery kind of quite a ways but my family my people, <laughs> my people. people came from Crane Hill, which is outside Coleman, about 25 miles or so. I Coleman. Think. I've been to Coleman. I did an Alice Chalmers tractor show there when I used to work for Alice Chalmers. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, I've been to Coleman. I sure have. Well, that's that's actually, I think it's probably big by now, but um, Crane Hill was the t little small town. Okay. Last story. Crane Hill. Well, it was tiny. There was a like a store, like a little store somewhere. And I think there was a post office, uh, but it was just, and it was a, for me and Selma, it was a one mile walk to get to that little store, but it was worth it to get that candy bar. Um, well, apparently back in, you know, the 1800s, there was only there a trading post. And um, because the name of, of Crane Hill was originally slap out. But they changed it to Crane Hill when they, when they when they put the post office in. Well, the reason why it was called Slap Out was because it was this trading post, and that's all there was. And the the guy, you know, traded everything. But he was notorious for never having anything in stock. So when you'd ask him, "Would you have any flour? Do you have any bread?" He'd say, "No, we're Slap Out." God. And they called it Slap Out Alabama, and that's what it was for years and years and years. So do you tell that story? People love that kind of stuff, you nope. know? I got oh. zillions of them. I don't have time to tell all the wonderful stories. Good gosh. But just like talking about your uncle, Uncle Ulysses. Uncle and Ulysses. Aunt Flossie. Flossie, yep. See, that's just rich. I mean, you know, Jerry Clower, I'm, I know you, you, when you listen to Jerry Clower, he talks about all of his kin, um, R nail, rain nail, blah, blah, <laughs> and Clovis. I mean, people oh, well. We had the the triplets called Euler. I'm sure it was Eula, but Euler, Bueller, and Luler. The triplets. Euler, Bueller, and Luler. Oh, and there were two boys, two brothers named Lemon and Lime. Now, I don't know where they came from, but. Oh, Lord. Yeah, I've heard we've got somebody around here. They One's named Laurangio, La one's named uh, Grillangio, and it was green and yellow jello. Somebody just got real creative. We were going, oh, say it ain't so. But Laurangio and Gromangio was crazy like that. But you tell people like that and they think, oh, you're just making that up. And you go, no, that's true. But, but see, that's funny. Well, but the thing is, and I have to be honest about this. So that was my mother's side of the family. My father's side of the family, they're Italian and they're from the Bronx. And so I would spend oh every God. other summer up in the Bronx and I actually lived up there. I was born in the Bronx. So I have all these loyalties to my Italian Bronx people who talk like this. You know what I mean? You have some coffee with your daughters at the, you know, when your daughters <laughs> and, your daughter, and you do that. So I have that whole thing. So if I'm going to tell any stories, I'm like, I, I got too many. I, I can go from the Bronx to, you know, Hope Hall, Alabama. And I, I, you know what? I, I think I take the Alabama talk and to the Italian uh, community and I'd, I'd I'd take the Italian thing. Girl, what you talking about? <laughs> That's oh, funny. I did though, but because when I was I was in Montgomery, I hadn't been back to New York for a long, long time. I was in Montgomery, and I had to go live in the Bronx with my Italian relatives while my mom was getting a, a operation, and my father was overseas at, in uh, the Air Force. And I, I had to go to PS one hundred and one or something like that. And th th I, this is so vivid in my memory. I'm thirteen years old. Oh. I'm from Montgomery, Alabama at that point. I've, I'm as white as a flipping ghost. I've got, I, I say I have green freckles. I, I think I always had green freckles. I don't know if they were really green, but I thought they were green. And I went into this school in the Bronx where it was 99% Hispanic, Black, um, Puerto Rican. I, 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 was, I was this one little white haired white person in the sea of ethnicity. And I was just, I felt it was great because it gave me an understanding of what it would feel like if that was all different. If, if a black person came to my school and it was an all white school, how they might feel. So that it gave me that perspective, but I did talk like that. And oh because, my God. I know. And I, that was not really well received. <laughs> Let me just tell you right now. <laughs>
Girl but, speaking in tongues, what she's doing? <laughs> Lord have mercy. Oh my gosh. Well, I just love that though, because that, that really, that, you know, I, I, when I meet folks that have traveled and children that have had to make it work, especially mm -hmm. military kids, they seem to be the most well adjusted just because okay. they've had to pull themselves up from the bootstraps and think, I got to do this. I don't have a choice. You know, I could just wig out and be weird, but, you know, and, and enjoy the, the different cultures and things that, that to me is that's a gift, Linda. That's wonderful. How long did you, were you in school in, uh, in that part of the country? Uh, just a half a year. It was a long half a year. Yeah. Um, but, but it was great. I, it, you know, to this day, I remember there was, a, it was a literature class and I'll never forget this. It just makes my heart swell when I think about it. It was, we were studying Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And um, the teacher said, does anybody want to read her poem, How Do I Love Thee? Oh, yeah. No. And I, I, hadn't, I hadn't spoken up at all. I mean, I was just kind of like this, I'll try my very level best to disappear. But theater is my thing and poetry is my thing. And, and I love that. And I just couldn't bear not putting my hand up. So it, just before she moved on, because nobody said yes, I went, Ugh. and she went, oh, okay. And I read the poem with oh. my, I know, and and I must have read, how do I love thee? I don't know, I must have, it must have been. But I just remember she came back to me afterwards and she said, I want you to be on our uh, poetry competition team or something like oh. that. So it's just, you know, it's that, it's that those little tiny moments, things happen. And, you know, I guess that one taught me just be brave anyway, just going to, be terrified to do it, but do it anyway. Susan, I Dr. love that. Doctor Susan Jeffers is the one that said it. Let me give her credit. She wrote the book called "Feel the Fear and Do yeah. It Anyway," and right. uh, I think that kind of changed things around for me. It made me think, you know what? Maybe I, maybe I have more um, abilities than I think I do. Well, then it, it taught you to be brave, have courage, and someone saw something special inside of you. Yeah, that you you use to build a career on that. You know, the first time somebody sees that inside of you that you hope people see, it's mm -hmm. so exciting. And Al Walker was talking about that in high school. One of his teachers said, I need to see you after class. And he's going, well, I've been trouble. And they said, you should do professional speaking or radio with that. You know, Al has that voice. voice. And it's so good. And that that is a spark of, of God planting a seed, I think. And it's up to us to germinate it. Well, let here's the thing I'm going to ask you, and I bet you do this. Don't you speak at events all around the world and you see other speakers, young new speakers, and you yeah. look at them and go, what? They are fabulous. I don't know if they know how fabulous they are. And you will take the time to go up to them and say, you have something really special. I, and I think that's what his teacher did, Al's teacher did for him. And that's, I'm sure that's what you do when you see young people. I do too. Oh yeah. And you know, I think it's important for us to pass the baton. And when we see someone really who has incredible abilities, you know, we, we just want to talk to them, get to know them. What are you doing with that? I've done that with books. You've written books, right? Mm -hmm. How many books do you have, Linda? I have one book and I have one audio program. The audio program is the one that did the best, um, sold close to 200,000 copies. So that's the I one that did. I know, I know it's a, a, yeah. And it, but you know, it's gone now because it came, it did its thing and now it's gone. And you know, it's kind of, I remember Joe Calloway once did that whole speech on let it go. Oh <laughs> so, Lord. I remember I was there. Oh Ooh. yeah. I was there. And, it, and that's, he was right on the money because there's certain things you just don't want to let go of, but you know, you think it did what it was supposed to do and now it's time to let it go. Gosh, and that's that, wonderful. Is there anything else in you? Are, do you have another book in you anywhere? I keep thinking I do. And then I keep thinking, nah, I don't. <laughs> I want I want to go to the beach and I want to go walking with my doggies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my publisher called me and said, we want you to write another book. I said, I guess you do. I mean, I'm thinking, is it still there? Because I work it off, you know. Like, um, well, not. you're very prolific. I mean, you don't oh. stop. You don't stop. 
Well, I don't know if, if, if it's just insanity. It looks, I live in this little small town and there's just not a whole lot to do. And so we just, you know, keep generating ideas and bouncing it off of people. But I, I tell you, this has been so fun. We're, we're about almost 10 minutes to the top of the hour. I want you and I'm going to put a little bar, a little graph to, to get uh, folks to know how to get in touch with you. So tell me how they can book you or find you or enjoy you or whatever you want folks to know. I think people can just go to my website, which is myname.com. So that's lindalarsen.com. And that is L-A-R-S-E-N as in the Danish side of things, which is not, mm -hmm. I'm not Danish, but <laughs> that was my married name. So it's lindalarsen.com. And I got funny videos there and I got some po or, um, blog posts there that I think are pretty cool. So come visit, say hi. I'd love to talk to you. Well, Linda, do you find yourself doing more uh, conferences or uh, do you do comedy, comedy clubs or co not comedy clubs, but comedy shows? Mm -mm. Yeah. No, but it seems like it's a lot of that's what a lot of conference meeting planners want is. Yeah. Give us a message, but be funny. <laughs> Just be yeah. funny. So a lot of, you know, the the the. Um, women's events um help women's health care events or th that kind of thing even even like the surgical i think it was surgical tech uh, association of surgical techs who are in uh, operating rooms and that sort of thing they said you know yeah give them some tools to help them you know manage the kind of stress they're dealing with but could you just make them laugh i think people really want that right now no, it isn't it so true? I yeah. mean, it seems like we're all just struggling to keep our nose above the water and dog paddle around. And and since COVID, oh my gosh, that has really taken a hit on so many things that that we love and that we've had to readjust. I mean, it you know, we also our calendars go explode, like no, and then a lot of those people are not quite back yet, they just aren't. They haven't been able to get their members excited or, and do you, do you still do virtual? Cause I know you did um, some virtual. Yeah. I'm with well, you, girl. Not, I, not this, I absolutely have to. Let's just and that's the truth. It, it's just the most frustrating thing. Cause you can't see if anybody's laughing or enjoying or whatever, you know? So, yeah. so what's in the future? What do you crystal ball moment? What are you seeing? I just, uh, I love this presentation that I did on mental well-being. It's called um, Breaking the Silence. Um, and it's about having those crucial conversations. Uh, and, and I've made it funny. Uh, you know, I sent it to my friend, Sarah Michelle, to say, would you read this and tell me what you think? Because she does a lot in the mental health industry. And she went right on your use of humor and yet to tell the story. And it's vulnerable and open. Yes, yes, yes. So she thinks that it has legs somewhere. And I would love to do that because I, I just think when you when you present something that does all hits all the little check boxes, you know, like makes people laugh, makes them think, gives them some tools and hits that chord inside where they go. Oh, me, too. I, I, I like it when I see people going, oh, my God, that's me. How did I you tell you, I, I know this, this is going to sound like work and we already talked about it, but that's a book. That's oh. a book right there. That's a book title. It's oh. a book title. That's dang good now. Because I'll tell you, my opinion. I love you. <laughs> book title. But, but you, the, you're my uh, cheerleader. I, I, I just love you. I think you're awesome. You could do that. Easy, easy peasy. You could do that. Um, but the, the thing is, what, what I am seeing is our country needs the mental health skills. And we, like my good friend I told you about, she would be checked in and check herself out. And the cycle yeah. continued. But, you know, then again, she didn't want to get to the bottom of the barrel and dig up all the stuff that's not pretty. But, Linda, you need to write that book. That could be your legacy right there, girl. I'm just telling you. Well, thank you. I would certainly something I will I will consider. I certainly People would love that. People would absolutely love it. It would be huge. And you would be really, really, really helping a lot of people. Isn't it funny? I mean, I got a booking a couple of weeks ago before I went on this trip. It seemed like it just clumped. I'm freaking out. And I thought, I can't speak to these people again. I mean, they, they, you know, come back, blah, blah, blah. So I did the whole, a whole new thing too, but it was, it was just, it was just something I was challenged to do and I was thankful, but those are the kinds of things that end up being such a gift 
mm-hmm. to not only ourselves, but we can be being a gift to others. And what your journey has been is absolutely amazing because mm-hmm. people can look at you and say, I can do this. Yeah. I, I, I've got to study how to make it happen. And people don't understand. And I don't. I mean, people said people say, oh, I'm depressed. Nobody really understands the depth of that kind of emotional pull. It's just like pluff mud that just sucks you down. Yeah. And and it, it, sometimes you just don't see anything to, to hold on to. Mm-hmm. Well, and I hope you do that because you're you're just blessed, girl. You are blessed. Well, you're very kind and loving and wonderful to say that. And I deeply I want appreciate. the first copy. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stay on you about that now. All righty. I, I, I even got your cover. I got your cover. Oh, my God. <laughs> I you got an accountability that, partner here. <laughs> you tell that precious weatherman you're married to that that's going to when when he decides to ease up on the career, that's what y'all got to dive into is this book. All right. Yeah. I'll tell you you said that. Well, thank you, honey. I appreciate it. I'm sorry we had a little rough start, but you're amazing. I love you. You have blessed me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. And I hope we get to connect again soon, please. We're going to do that. No doubt. Big hug, honey. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. the five and ten listening once again with candy canes and silver lanes of glow it's beginning